morning. The title of my message today is Whoever Believes in Jesus Has Eternal Life. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us this time here today, Lord. I just pray that you would please help us, Lord, that we may have a heart that is open and ready to receive your word. May you come into this place and your spirit may speak through this message Say what you want to say to us and help us, Lord, that we may know your great love. Come into your light and live our life for you. Lord, I really thank you for this time, and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This passage is based on John chapter 3, verses 16 to 36, and the key verse is verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Last week, we heard Jesus' teaching to Nicodemus, one of the top religious leaders in the nation. We learned that the way to experience and one day enter the kingdom of God is to be born again. When one is born again, the Holy Spirit changes our inner disposition so that we truly change. You know, many people try to accomplish such change by their own willpower, like trying to change the course of a boat that's set on autopilot by straining the wheel. You know, every change and every turn will feel unnatural, and the boat always wants to go back to the direction it's set. But if by the Holy Spirit one changes the autopilot, the boat naturally turns itself. Jesus taught us that the way such change is possible is only when we look up at Jesus on the cross and repent of our sins by faith. It's all about Jesus. The whole Bible is about Jesus. That's today's message. I'm done. <laughs> you know, but last week we stopped in the middle of the story uh, of chapter 3. Beginning in verse 16, John goes on to elaborate the meaning of Jesus being lifted up and the deep implications that it has for our life. We want to think about three points. One, why God sent Jesus into the world. Two, why people do not accept him. And three, why Jesus must be everything. You know, our world is full of so much darkness right now, and it may seem that there are a lot of things that we need to do to solve it. But the only answer for the world today is Jesus. First, Jesus is God's love for the world. Let's read verse 16 all together. Okay, let's go. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This verse begins with the word for, referring back to verses 14 and 15. Jesus said that for us to enter the kingdom of God, the son of man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Verse 16 goes on to explain and expand the scope of these words. Why did God lift up Jesus? Je John explains the motivation was love for the world. It wasn't to fulfill prophecy or to give us a grudging concession for sin, but love. And that makes all the difference. God so loved, what? The world. These words are unique to John's gospel, referring to all people, especially the sinful Gentile world that did not know God and did not deserve to be saved. But can holy God Almighty really love the world, full of sin and full of people like Nicodemus who blatantly refuse to believe? Actually, through the Old Testament, we can see that God's history is the story of God's enduring love. When God made Adam and Eve, he blessed them to rule over the earth and subdue it, and he gave them every good thing that they needed. But they believed Satan's lie, God doesn't love you. And then they sought to make themselves God, plunging all of creation into sin. In God's holy justice, he should have destroyed the world. End of story. 
But God so loved the world that he said, I will give you a way that you may avoid my judgment. God then began to work throughout history to bring salvation to all people by raising the nation of Israel to bless all people on earth. However, they rejected him to his face generation after generation and turned to any other God that they could find. Yet God so loved the world that he would not abandon them. God demonstrated this through the prophet Hosea. The Lord said to Hosea, go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods. In fact, after reading the Old Testament, we're blown away by God's patient, enduring, and long-suffering love. Still, we wonder, how can God's love endure so much? Surely God's patience will run out and reach its limit, and he will give up on me, right? <laughs> no. The Bible says God is love. This love in Greek is agape. It's not sappy, a sappy emotional feeling or conditional human love. Agape is God's universal, unconditional love that transcends and persists regardless of circumstance. It is God's willful decision to love sinners regardless of what they do. Agape love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. God's love never fails. We can rest in this love. No matter how far we've wandered from God, God still loves us. One young man was very slippery and eventually was almost kicked out of our church because of his sins. But one shepherd reached out to him, making him her right hand in the new mission work she was doing. But many asked, uh, why did she reach out to that guy? <laughs> but that's the gospel that God loves sinners, that he never gives up on them, and his love never fails. Yes, even that guy can be changed by God's love, and God's love transformed his life. He can now confess, I am a shepherd for NEIU students. There is no one who is beyond the love of God. Still, yes, we can believe God loves sinners, but we can't believe that God loves a sinner like me. You know, one man tried to work very hard for God because he believed that when he was good, God loved him, but that when he failed, God would surely condemn him for his sins. As a result, he was grumpy all the time and full of condemnation and kind of scary. But he wanted to learn the grace of God. So he began a personal study of the book of Romans. There he found Romans 5.10, For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? He realized that God loved him when he had done nothing. So God would not suddenly become harsh and condemning now that he was his child. He realized that God loved him one-sidedly based on nothing that he had done. And so nothing he could do would remove that love. And he was set free. What's more, the expression of God's love should make us understand our great worth before God. Look at verse 16 again. You know, it can also be translated, for God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son. How did God love the world? He gave his one and only son. That's right. He gave his one and only son. These words immediately remind us of Abraham, whom God tested, saying, Take your son, your only son whom you love, and sacrifice him. His son was the most precious thing in all the world to him. When Abraham decided to obey God, he was saying that God was worth more than anything to him. 
And God said, Abraham, do not lay a hand on the boy. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Instead, God provided the lamb for the sacrifice. And God has provided the lamb. God gave his one and only son, the son whom he loved for the world. This elevates the world. The world is not this worthless object of God's wrath. All people, no matter how they may look, are those whom God gave his one and only son for. So why did God give his one and only son? Verse 16b says that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God created humanity to live in eternity with him, in paradise. But he warned them, if you disobey me, you will surely die. When humanity sinned, we were separated from the eternal life of God, and we died. As a result, from God's perspective, all people are dead men walking, destined to perish and go to the same punishment as the devil and his angels in the fiery lake of burning sulfur where the worm that eats them does not die and the fire never goes out. Some people imagine that a loving God cannot send people to hell. But what would be the loving thing to do if your children rebelled against you, took over your house, killed your spouse, and threw you out into the street saying, never return. Let them live their life until others died, until the whole neighborhood became hell. Or someone like Hitler, who killed 11 million people, should he just be forgiven of his crimes and not brought to justice? Well, of course, of course Hitler should go to hell. But what about this? What about a father who commits adultery and ends up having a child out of wedlock? It seems pretty commonplace in our society, right? Maybe that can pass. What, what about if that child, what about if the child was born to his cousin and then that father beat the child growing up out of spite? What if he beat him so much and so often that he turned the child into a monster who killed 11 million people. That's the story of Alois Hitler, the father of Adolf Hitler. And you know, before I searched this story, I knew that's what I would end up finding. The sin of the father had caused it. You know, there isn't innocent sin and serious sin. There's just sin. Sin always gives birth to sin and leads to escalating evil. Our sin destroys God's world. When we consider honestly the rebellion of man against God, the level of evil we have done, and the degree to which we have corrupted God's good world, the question is not why doesn't God give us more chances to be saved, but rather why does he even give us one? The answer is that God in his great love does not want anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. If we repent our sins and look up to Jesus, we will be saved. And not only saved, but restored the gift of eternal life. Eternal life, Zoe in Greek, is not living after death. Even those in hell will live forever but is a crossing over from a dead life to the true life, the abundant life, the life to the full, which we can experience now in the body and forever beyond our imagination when we go to be with the Lord. Then given the extent of God's love and promises to the world, we must consider what is God's mission to this lost world? Verse 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus did not need to condemn the world, because as verse 18 says, the world stands condemned already. What the world needs then is to be saved from this horrible fate. Jesus' coming into the world is a rescue mission. Are we part 
of that rescue mission. Jesus had harsh words for the Bible experts of his time. And you experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry. And you yourselves are not willing to lift one finger to help them. When you see other sinners, sinners just like you, do you say to yourself, do you want to condemn them? Or do you say they need Jesus? I'm speaking to myself here as much as I'm speaking to you. God says, whoever believes will not be condemned. Good people, bad people, gay, straight, murderers, immoral, idolaters, outspoken atheists, anyone, whoever, would repent of their sins, renounce their false gods, and look up to Jesus for salvation will be saved and will not be condemned. Thank you, Jesus. Second, don't hide from Jesus' love. The gospel is such amazingly good news for all people, right? So we must ask the question, how could anyone not accept it? Well, let's read verses 19 through 21. 19 through 21 in your Bibles. Let's go. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. You know, people may come up with many logical arguments and doubts and complaints about why they can't accept Jesus. But the verdict is that the root cause is sin. This is not only true for unbelievers, but it's true for Christians who choose to live in sin. 1 John 1, 5 through 6 says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Whoever loves sinning is living in darkness. Jesus said clearly that no one can serve two masters. Those who love their sin from God's perspective hate Jesus because they hate the way of repentance and the new way of life that he has offered. If those in the light live by the truth, then those who live in darkness live by the lie. You know, Satan uses two lies to keep people in the darkness and keep them in bondage. First is the love of darkness. He lies that if we come into the light, we will lose our fun and we will have no life. For example, have you ever gotten tricked into watching YouTube for hours? <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> why, why, why do you stop watching? You're bored, am I right? <laughs> you know, and then the next day, you watch it again, thinking, well, this time, this time, I'll be satisfied. But, but it doesn't work again. You know, the same is true of playing video games or partying. I used to have friends in college who worked hard during the week because they looked forward to partying all weekend long. Yet, after a weekend of partying, they were like dead men walking on Monday. And they said, oh, never again. But somehow by Friday, they convinced themselves, this time, I'm going to be satisfied. It's a lie. Sin only offers death, not life. The second lie that Satan uses to keep people in darkness is fear of being exposed. He lies that if we expose our sin, the shame and the fallout will be too great and that it is safer to hide in the dark. This weapon of Satan is especially powerful against Christians and keeps many in bondage for many years. When people indulge in one sin and do not confess and expose it and repent of it, it becomes stronger and stronger until it becomes like a fortress and a stronghold of Satan in their heart. 
Darkness is the place of hiding. And if there is anything that we are hiding in our life, then we are in darkness. To illustrate this, I asked some of our CBF kids to take some video in their homes and in our Bible houses of you guys on the computer and on the phones. And I'm going to show you some of the juicy parts of the video here on the next slide. Uh, next slide. Oh, oh, just kidding. I got you. <laughs> but, but how many of you, how many of you jumped when the slide switched? <laughs> okay. That's darkness. <laughs> you want to hide something, that's darkness. And the longer we hide something, the stronger it gets. And the more subtly it will begin to make us hate the gospel. Then what can we do? Come into the light. The light is the place where everything is exposed. Without the repentance of sin, there is no way that we can come to Jesus and live in him. You know, in my life, there have been two great battles against sin. One was video games, and the other was pornography. You know, at first, battling these things was epic, like trying to move a mountain. It's because in the darkness, at my core, I loved my sin, and I was constantly terrified of it being exposed. And so these things had great power over me. Yet, when I confessed my sins again and again before God and others and brought them into the light, amazingly, it became very easy to overcome them. In the end, in each case, I made one clear decision and never turned back. Sometimes, when I was down, they tried to entice me again, sure, but in the light, I could see very clearly how silly and disgusting they were, and it was ridiculous to turn back, and so I did not. There is no better feeling than being able to stand before God and man and say, I have nothing to hide. Amen? Amen. Those who live by the truth happily come into the light without regret and without fear. It's because they understand the deep truth of the gospel, that if they confess, they will be forgiven. 1 John 1, 7 and 9 say, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son purifies us from all sin. And verse 9 says, If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You know, it's always possible that we may be judged by people. But those who live by the truth don't fear people. They fear God. They come into the light with all of their flaws and their dirt and their shame, all easily exposed without fear, humbly repenting and confessing. And God purifies them from all unrighteousness. The great strength of our ministry has always been repentance. Every morning through daily bread. Every week through deep testimony writing. Every day as we raise disciples. Every minute as we raise godly house churches. This is such a blessed life. Repentance releases the Spirit's power into our life. Every great revival that has ever happened, beginning from the Pentecost until now, has been marked by a time of deep repentance that released the Spirit's power in ways that changed whole nations. If we want to experience the great love and salvation and light and work of the Spirit in our lives, in our families, and in our ministry, we must love the light, expose our sin, and love to repent deeply every day. May God help us to live fully in the light as those who live by the truth. Amen. Amen. Third, Jesus must become greater, I must become less. After this, Jesus spent time with his disciples in the Judean countryside where he continued John's baptism ministry. However, John was also still baptizing. It seemed that the stage was set for a conflict between competing ministries. Sure enough, 
an argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew. It seems, given the context to be, why is John still baptizing? Everyone is going to Jesus. His baptism is better. So the disciples came to John and exclaimed, Rabbi, that man who is with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, that he's the Lamb of God, that he surpassed you, that he takes away the sins of the world, that the Holy Spirit remains on him, that he baptized with the Holy Spirit, that he's God's chosen one. Yeah, you know that guy? Look, he's baptizing and everyone's going to him. Can you believe it? <laughs> These men had such a fierce human loyalty to John that they refused to see or get involved with what God was doing. It's a great danger in ministry. John's reply may have been very surprising to them. You know, in recent years, even recent weeks, we've seen so many tragic church scandals that have come into the light. It seems to be a really appropriate time to think about how to keep ministry centered on Jesus. Firstly, and most importantly, we must accept that the people we shepherd and those who come into the church are never ours. They are Jesus's. Firstly, uh, John testified plainly. A person can only receive what God gives them. I'm not the Messiah, so the bride doesn't belong to me. It belongs to him. You know, in this metaphor, Jesus is the groom and the bride is the church. John never had any illusion that the ministry was his. He prepared everything, and it was only ever for Jesus. Secondly, we should be full of joy when God gets the win, not coveting his glory for ourselves. Verses 29 to 30 say, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. The role of the friend of the bridegroom was a tremendous honor given to the very best friend of the groom, and he prepared everything for the wedding. There was no guest happier at the wedding celebration than him. This is how John saw himself. The friend of the bridegroom joyfully makes the preparations for the groom. He doesn't marry the bride. <laughs> when we know what our mission is, then we look for a way to give God the win, even if it means that we need to step aside in order to help a sheep or our ministry. It doesn't need to be about us, but how God can get the win, even if it's through others. It's all about Jesus, Amen. not us. We try our best, but we are not from heaven. Jesus is the one who is above all. Jesus speaks the words of God. Jesus is the one who has been entrusted with all things. We must lead people to Jesus. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. The world is condemned. That is God's verdict against sin. But God so loved the world that whoever believes in the Son will not perish but have eternal life. Amen. Jesus is not one among many ways, but he is the only way. He is the one that we do not deserve. Today, let's trust God's love and come to the light Confess our sins and repent, believing in God's great love expressed through Jesus. Let's receive the free gift of eternal life and live lives that are all about Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for helping us, Lord, that we could come before you and hear your word to us today. Lord, I really thank you so much for Jesus. I thank you so much, Lord, that you so loved the world that you gave your one and only son who was lifted up for us on the cross so that any who believe in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Lord, help us that we may believe in your love, trust in your love, and come into the light confessing all of our sins and whatever it is that's keeping us from you 
You may remove it, Lord, from our hearts and help us that we may come. Lord, help us that we may make everything that we are doing, everything in our life, everything we believe, may it all be for you. May it all be about you, Lord. You may be everything. Lord, I really pray that all people may not perish, but that they may come to you, Lord, for life, and that especially each one of us may struggle to really accept you this uh, morning, Lord. I thank you so much for giving us this time, and I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.